We are now going to discuss this issue of a new world order. As we saw in Revelation chapter 17, the kings of the world give their power unto the beast. In the keys of this blood, Malachi Martin tells us that the greatest geopolitical giant of our age is the Pope. He says, on his trip to Poland, barely eight months after his election, he signaled the opening of the Millennium End Game. He became the first of three players to enter the new geopolitical arena. He says that Pope John Paul would stride on now in the arena of this end game as something more than a geopolitical giant of his age. He was and remains the serene and confident servant of the grand design. This is Masonic signal language. Here is John Paul II with the Trilateral Commission. And here is John Paul II with B'nai Berit, Jewish Freemasonry. This is a fascinating signal picture with him in the center controlling the most powerful think tanks in the world. Because that's what the signal tells us. We saw in Revelation chapter 17 already some pictures of the powers of the world giving themselves over to the papacy. Lech Walesa being honored for his work with the host in public. The Bush Gorbachev summit in Malta, George Bush referred to as a gateway to the millennium of freedom, and it was heralded as the building of a new world. It is a big idea, a new world order, where diverse nations are drawn together in common cause. Only the United States has both the moral standing and the means to back it up. So they want to create this new world order. Revelation chapter 13 said that the beast that comes up out of the earth would be the power that did it. Bush confirms that for us. By 1990, a peace prize went to Gorbachev for losing his country. A man of the decade he became, and the old symbols, which are Masonic symbols of the East German Empire, were removed. The communist emblem leaves. Pretoria News, August 20, 1999. A summit meeting with 63, in 63 countries about neoliberalism, and Fidel Castro gives a Masonic signal. Here he is with the papacy. All these so-called countries that are against what the establishment stands for are only against in the sense that they are playing the game of Hegelianism. Thesis, antithesis. But behind the scenes, they all belong to the same club. Let's just verify that. Fidel was significantly influenced by Jesuit father Armando Lorento and Alberto de Castro, uh, de Castro admired Fancro. Fidel was very active in a Jesuit organization similar to the Boy Scouts, the Explorers. Wherever totalitarian movement erupts, wh whether communist or Nazi, a Jesuit can be found in the role of advisor or leader. In Cuba, it was Castro's father, father Amando Lorente. So forget about the idea that Cuba was anti-Pope. A Jesuit was behind the scenes, they were playing the game of thesis, antithesis. When tyrants fall in Romania and Panama and all these countries, these tyrants were put in place to create a system of fear and chaos, and then they are removed and the people are happy to give up their civil liberties. We've already seen this video here of the Pope, who receives honor from Bill Clinton for his uh, role in ending the communist empire. 2,400 of his faithful here to welcome him. He's waving to the crowd. Archbishop Regali is alongside the Pope as he shakes hands with the First Lady. We honor you for helping to lead a revolution of values and spirit in Central Europe and the former Soviet Union, freeing millions to live by conscience, not coercion, 
and freeing all of us from the constant fear of nuclear war. Your Holiness, on behalf of all of us gathered here today, indeed on behalf of all the people of our beloved nation, we welcome you back to America. Ladies and gentlemen, His Holiness Pope John Paul II and the Vice President of the United States and Archbishop Pope declares the European community heaven sent. Very fascinating. Konrad Ardenauer, who was the German Chancellor at that particular time when this was being devised, well, he is to be declared a saint. Can you believe that? He is to be declared a saint for his work. Pope declares EU heaven sent and saints at the moment, Roman Catholic principles, they are to be declared saints. Now, to bring about the European Union, they had Maastricht. Maastricht is a Roman Catholic little town in a Protestant country in the Netherlands. And the symbolism there was very interesting, the 12 stars. They represent also the 12 stars that you have in the book of Revelation, which they apply to Mary, rather than to the woman in white. It is also fascinating that the European Union issued a poster which was posted all over Europe where they had the Tower of Babel under construction. Can you see that? This was posted all over Europe and the stars were upside down representing the goat of Mendes. This is Satanism. This is the new Tower of Babel and uh, the high French politicians said, we are building a new Babel, which they emphasized with this poster, and this time we will succeed. The new parliament of the European community is built like the Tower of Babel. In fact, it has a plaque on the inside or a poster which says precisely this. And it has this scaffolding to give the appearance that it is under construction. This is rather arrogant. This is the new European identity card. And if you look at it at the back and you turn it upside down, what do you see? You see the goat of Mendes. The horns are slightly modified to give another symbolism of the seat of the earth. But uh, the inner facial features of the goat are very clearly discernible. And what these mean over here, I would rather not say. If we look at the high politicians of Europe, those that played the role in all of this, they are Masonic. That is a Masonic handshake between Schroeder and Kohl, signifying the new Mason is taking over where the old Mason is leaving. So just as we saw that uh, Kerry is a Skull and Bones member in uh, America now, and the present president is a Skull and Bows member, it doesn't member, matter which one is going to win. So here too, Mason replaces Mason. Fingering the system, they're all showing that they're all part of the same system. When the Soviet Union fell, the new emblem that it adopted was this one, the double-headed eagle. Could you guess why? Well, the double-headed eagle is the symbol of Freemasonry, and it obviously shows who is in control. The queens, the kings of the world, as we have seen, all of them are high masons and subject to the Roman pontiff. And Islam, we did a whole lecture to show the intrigue of the Islamic religion and the Catholic religion that behind the scenes, controlled by the secret societies, they have one aim, and one aim alone, subject to Rome. So what is all this war about with Islam? Who are these people who are pulling the strings in the world? And why are people being rubbed up between them? From the rock stars of the world, the bonos of the world, to the political leaders of the world, everyone seems to be bowing down to the papal Caesar. 
from the east to the west. The Islamic world is currently being set up as the synthesis in the religious world, pitted against the Judea Christian culture as the antithesis, and then out of this must come a synthesis, where all of them will unite. This is a website, there is the, the actual website underneath, and this one I believe fairly accurately says who's who in the zoo. Adam Weishaupt, Astor, Pike, Carnegie, DuPont, Harriman, Bertrand Russell, Ted Kennedy, these are the Illuminatis uh, of yesteryear and today. George W. Bush, of course, he's a Skull and Bones member, that's a sub-organization of Chapter 322 of a German organization, the Illuminati, therefore, Bundy, Habsburg, Freeman, Teng Hui, Hillary Clinton, Alan Greenspan, Rockefeller, Rothschild, Wahlberg, these are the bankers in the system, the negotiators, uh, Lord Carrington, Jimmy Carter, Henry Kissinger, Lord David Owen, Richard Holbrook, these are 33 free Mason, degree Freemasons, or Knights of Malta, or Bilderbergers, Committee of 300, they all belong to the same club. If we look at uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt, Cecil Rhodes, Engels, all of these, Trotsky, Stalin, Marx, Hoover, all of their affiliations, Grand Orient Lodge, for example, Grand Orient Lodge, uh, Lenin was Grand Orient Lodge, Truman, 33 degree, Willy Brandt, 33 degree, Winston Churchill. We've seen many of these before. Helmut Kohl, Committee of 300, Francois Mitterrand, 33 degree Freemason, he does, he is not alive anymore, Yitzhak Rabin, Yasser Arafat, 33 degree Freemason. These are fascinating the details, Shimon Perez, Ronald Reagan, George Bush, Gerald Ford. I showed you Gerald Ford's signature where he signed for himself that he was a 33 degree Freemason. There it is, I photographed it in the lodge. And the Carters and these great political people in the world, the Schroeders, the Netanyahu's, the Gorbachevs, there is Saddam Hussein listed as a 33 degree Freemason. Now that is somewhat strange, wouldn't you say? King Hussein, Al Gore, Tony Blair, all of these issues. Look at Saddam Hussein over there. Here's a picture of Saddam Hussein. And this is a picture that was beamed on national television during the war. During the war of what he looked like. Now, they also said at that stage that they weren't sure whether this was pre-taped. That means it could have been pre-taped before the war even took place. Because if they are insiders, they would know who's who and what is going to happen. Now, there is a very interesting rumor about this man. Have a look at his face and have a look at the fact that he has no beard. The CIA, as well as the British Secret Service, said at the time it could be a double. It could be a double, but nevertheless, that is what was depicted, he has always looked like this, he's never had a beard, this is what he's looked like. Operation Iraqi Freedom, Saddam's double trouble, opposition leader claims Hussein died of cancer in 99, this was posted March 26, 2003, Muslim al Asadi, a doctor living in exile in Iran, said he believes the real Saddam died in 1999 from cancer. The real Saddam died because he had cancer of the lymph nodes and since his death in 1999 they're just showing his doubles, he told the Tandian newspaper. That's a, f a fascinating story. If Saddam Hussein was really dead and the others were pre-recorded stories, then who was ruling in his place? His sons and his wife and his other children were also there. It fascinated me that the moment the war broke out and England and the United States went in there, that uh, the wife and the children of Saddam Hussein, except the two ruling sons, were taken away and received exile, where? But in Great Britain. So the country that attacks takes the family, the whole family of Saddam, and gives them uh, political exile in Great Britain. Very strange. Now if he was dead and they were putting doubles in front, and they were ruling really through the sons, 
and they showed these shot up bodies of two individuals who nobody knows who they really are, who knows whether that is really so or whether that is not so. Despite the reference to Um Kaza, British intelligence thought the broadcast may have been pre-recorded. This is a fact. We are well aware that he spent many hours recently tape recording various messages. We have to do a little more analysis of what he was actually saying to see whether or not that in fact was Saddam Hussein. British Defence Minister Geoff, Jeff Hoon told reporters, White House spokesman Ari Fleischer said, I think there are some doubts about whether that tape is canned or whether it's fresh and based on recent events. So both of the secret services question these issues. Then they find, finally, Saddam Hussein's hideout, the filthy place, they say, and they arrest the man and show him on national television. After that, one does not hear too much. And he has a magnificent beard. A magnificent beard. Now if the previous one was shot during the war, then this must be the best hair fertilizer that mankind has ever <laughs> found. Maybe he could become a multi-zillionaire patenting this fertilizer to make this beard grow as it is. They used at least three doubles who knows who this man is. And to say that they did blood tests who knows whether you can trust the laboratories that did this. Nevertheless, he's listed as a 33-degree Freemason. There, is, there are plenty of questions regarding this man, and uh, there is no evidence except for his family that is safely living in exile. Royalty, Prince Bernard of the Netherlands is 300, uh, Committee of 300, and here um, Prince, Prince Beatrice and... Uh, Prince Bertil, the Queen, of course, Prince Philip, all of them high Freemasons. Mengele, Walt Disney, all of these individuals. The world is really run by these individuals. Here is the Duke of Kent giving the Masonic handshake under the Masonic shield. He is the current Grand Master. So he is the highest Freemason at the moment, if you like, because a king may not be, or a prince may not be, the Grand Master. He is currently the Grand Master. So here is the highest Luciferian in the country at the moment. Political leaders, the Bill Clintons and all of these, we've dealt with them. Uh, we don't have to go through all of them again, the Jesse Helms, the Goldwaters, the Al Gores, and all of these individuals. And I've put the, the pages up there, and there are many, many books that substantiate all of these names. So just about everybody who is important in the world, everybody who runs in the political sphere, is involved in these clandestine operations. We saw in the lecture on Revelation chapter 17 and 13 how there would be a holy alliance and how the United States would eventually become the powerhouse for propagating a new world order. Gorbachev summit in Malta, referred to as the gateway to the millennium of freedom, as you will remember, and the initiative came for this great movement into a new world order. Now, let us have a look at this video where George Bush has something to say on this issue. Where institutions of freedom have lain dormant, the United Nations can offer them new life. These institutions play a crucial role in our quest for a new world order. An order in which no nation must surrender one iota of its own sovereignty an order characterized by the rule of law rather than the resort to force. So he says, all the nations don't have to give up one iota of their sovereignty, but we want them all in a new world order. Basically, that is what he said, out of the horse's mouth. And then this terrible incident took place. And, well, there were many, many deaths. A very strange incident. But before we get to it, 
Let's first have, the, have a look at some of the history of this issue. The United States had a problem in that it wanted to introduce anti-terrorism laws, but there was no real terrorism in the United States. And then all of a sudden, a building in Oklahoma, April 19, 1995, was gutted by explosions, and they fingered a man, Timothy McVeigh, who worked alone, they said, and brought this building down by parking a van filled with explosive outside and blowing the building to smithereens. That's the official report. Inside were women and young children, and if anything gets the sympathy of the people, well, then that is surely one of them. Let's have a look at what happened here. Through federal authorities that a second bomb has been found inside that federal building in Oklahoma City. It was an explosion at 9 o'clock this morning that did that damage you're looking First at right bomb there. I'm getting that was in the federal building did go off. It did the damage that you see right there. The second explosive was found and diffused. The third explosive that was found, and they are working on right now as we speak, I understand, both the second and third explosives, if you can imagine this, were larger than the first. First bomb that was in the federal building did go off. It did the damage that you see right there. So you heard there on national television that a second bomb went off and it did the damage that you saw over there. They found a third explosive device within the side the building. The official report, however, says what? That there was a van outside with explosives. Now, I was not there. I was not there. So I'm not going to set myself up as a judge as to what happened over there. I can merely say what the report said, what the news said, and then we'll ask some questions, and you decide what happened over there. Timothy McVeigh apparently worked alone, just like in the Kennedy case, and it blew this place up. But eyewitnesses say, no, they saw two individuals, and they saw this truck on a previous day, and they had a number. But when this building exploded, there was no real crater where this truck is supposed to have exploded. Now, if a truck explodes outside the building, there must be a crater, and the building must implode. But the building didn't implode, it exploded. And that was done by a device on the inside, as you heard over here. So now, to fit the case and to say it was a truck, the people said, well, surely if it was a truck, then there must be some parts left of that truck. I mean, an explosion doesn't just get rid of every piece of a truck. It might be in smithereens, but there should be a piece of an engine block or something like that. There was nothing. Eventually, the pressure became so great that a CIA agent jogging four blocks away stumbled over the rear axle of the truck and found it. But the problem was, how do you identify this rear axle as part of that truck? Now, they had a registration number, and fortunately, the number was on the rear axle. Now, nowhere in the whole world do you put registration numbers of vehicles on rear axles. <coughs> so this is a strange issue. But anyway, he was fingered as the sole one. But there is so much suspicion surrounding this explosion, and then eventually a firm got the contract and they gutted that building before there was any possibility of looking into what happened at that particular event. Then came another event, the Twin Towers. Now what happened after the first event? After the Oklahoma bombing, the United States, within just five days, had anti-terrorism legislation. And that anti-terrorism legislation gave powers to the President of the United States where he could suspend the Constitution. But it didn't give powers where the United States could unilaterally enter any country in the world to do as it pleased. For that, it needed a war-footing legislation, as was the case with Pearl Harbor. There needed to be an incident. Well, 
an incident arrived in that the Twin Towers were destroyed. President Bush speaks to the United Nations General Assembly November 10, 2001. We must speak the truth about terror. Let us never tolerate outrageous conspiracy theories concerning the attacks of September the 11th. Malicious lies that attempt to shift the blame away from the terrorists themselves, away from the guilty. Now isn't it interesting that George Bush there said, let us not tolerate conspiracy theories that shift the blame away from the terrorists themselves. Why? Because so many people started believing that everything was not right with these particular issues. Now, let's have a look at the first hit. When this happened, the first aeroplane struck. Tim, your life is going to change, but more important, your son's life is going to change forever. America will never be the same after September 11th. We've been preparing for this kind of event for nearly a decade. We've had presidential directives. It's a project called Homeland Defense. We are, as we have been saying this morning, in a... So what we have, we have footage of the very first airplane striking that building. That means there was an opportunity to record that. Very quickly, the following happened. Even as the leaders of the Taliban deny any role in this, an Arab, based, an Arab journalist based in London is quoted today to the Associated Press as saying that followers of Osama bin Laden warned three weeks ago they were going to carry out this sort of an attack. The chief of safety of the fire department of New York City told me he received word of the possibility of a secondary, secondary device, device, that is another Listen. bomb going off. Uh, he tried to get his men out as quickly as he could, but he said that there was another explosion which took place, and according to his theory, he thinks that there were actually devices that were planted in the building. Forty-five minutes into the taping that we were doing, there was a, an explosion. It was way up where the fire was, and the whole building at that point bellied out in flames and everybody ran. I was about five blocks away when that, I heard uh, explosions, three thuds and turn around to see the building we just got out of antenna tip over and fall in on itself. And then all of a sudden it started like, like it sounded like gunfire, you know, bang, 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 bang. And then, and then all of a sudden three big explosions. All right, so the eyewitnesses said that they heard secondary devices. Bang, 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 and a series of explosions, and then these buildings came down. Demolition experts said that this is exactly what happens in a controlled demolition. You see, when an aeroplane strikes, there was a huge fireball, and the fireball is the burning of all the fuel on, side, on board the aeroplane. So there was nothing left there to explode, what was responsible for the secondary explosions. If we look at the setup, you will see there are the Twin Towers and there are buildings all around and these buildings were either slightly damaged or not seriously damaged and then there is a, a road and there's another building over there called building number seven and that building came down sometime afterwards, although nothing hit it. And not much was ever said about that. What caused building number seven to implode? Let's watch it. Okay, now watch Eight close. Eight hours after the right first plane is. crash, a third building at the World Trade Center collapses. This one, the number seven World Trade Center building. This is a look at the flying you'll debris see seven from the number coming seven down. tower. You're going to see watch that the explosion almost coming down coming the street this toward the camera. Number seven tower at the World Trade Center. The CIA would have been in there normally, but they had, of course, abandoned the building uh, when the uh, event, the catastrophe occurred. So who would have been in that building? The CIA would have been in that building, but they had evacuated the building. And eight hours afterwards, the building comes down in a control controlled, it seems, implosion. 
Now, nothing hit that building, and these are very strange, strange questions that we have to consider. After this event, there was a Canadian response. And there was a great resolution passed at the United Nations last night that might bring about a new order in the world that would be better for all of us. All of this was brought upon us in a single day. And night fell on a different world. A world where freedom itself is under attack. So the Canadian response was, this could bring about a new order in the world as it was decided at the United Nations after a meeting. Gary Hart, what did he have to say? There is a chance for the President of the United States to use this disaster to carry out what his father, a phrase his father used I think only once and hasn't been used since, and that is a new world order. Jim, your life is going to change, but more important, your son's life is going to change forever. America will never be the same after September 11th. We've been preparing for this kind of event for nearly a decade. We've had presidential directives. It's a project called Homeland Defense. We are, as we have been saying this morning, in a state of war. Even the as the leaders of the Taliban deny any role in this, an Arab, based, an Arab journalist based in London is quoted today to the Associated Press as saying that followers of Osama bin Laden warned three weeks ago they were going to carry out this sort of an attack. The chief of safety of the fire department of New York City told me he received word of the possibility of a secondary device, that is another bomb going off. Uh, he tried to get his men out as quickly as he could, but he said that there was another explosion which... All right, that's enough. We've seen the buildings coming down. We've heard that while these things were still happening, the American government had fingered the culprits. A bunch of terrorists, main naming their names, about 25 of them altogether, and the whole plot had been resolved by the end of the events that unfolded that day. An amazing piece of detective work after the event while it was even happening. Now, again, let me say I was not there. So let me tell you what has transpired and what people have said about these issues in the world, what has been published and what is fact that cannot be disputed. And then I don't make a judgment because I wasn't there. You make the judgment based on the facts. This is the story. They say the terrorists were of Arab extraction and they mentioned the names of the passengers on these aeroplanes which were United Airline aeroplanes. And the mastermind behind the scene is a man by the name of Atta, who is fingered as the one who received instruction on how to fly an aeroplane. Well, when they released the names, immediately there was a hue and cry from the Arab countries because five of the terrorists, supposed terrorists, mentioned that they were very much alive and well and couldn't have been on the plane. Right? Very important. They were alive and well and couldn't have been on the plane. How did they know that Atta was the mastermind? You see, on his way to the airport, he had just happened to leave his documents in the taxi that was transporting him. So they had his documentation. Which terrorist would leave his documentation behind? That is the one question. The next point that is very interesting is that they have evidence that he was the man because he wrote a suicide note. This is all fact. This is all published fact, what I'm saying now. I'm not making this up. This is all reference, this is, this is a fact. You decide the rest for yourself. Now, he wrote a suicide note. And the suicide note, he then placed within his suitcase. And then he handed in the suitcase, as we normally do when we go onto the airplane. Now, which person would write a suicide note that was going to be destroyed in an airplane clash? Does that make any sense? So the fact of the matter is they have a suicide note, but now the question is if he handed in his suitcase 
to be put on top uh, inside the plane, how come they have the suicide note? Well, just by chance, this is the one suitcase they forgot to put on the plane. And that is how they have his note. How do they know there were Arab terrorists in there? Because a passport, nothing else survived that plane crash, but a passport fell out and it happened to be a burnt out passport, which still could identify one of the terrorists. This is very circumstantial. Now, as these aeroplanes with absolute precision struck those twin towers, their black boxes were totally obliterated. These are of titanium and are designed to survive such crashes. There is no evidence of them whatsoever. They have been totally destroyed. So we have a very strange situation. What hill hit building number seven? Nothing hit it, but it came down in like fashion. And there is plenty of evidence that uh, there were possibly secondary devices in the buildings, as you heard from the commentators themselves. So what about the infrastructure of the aeroplanes? Well, there are certain parts lying there, so there was definitely a situation where those planes hit that particular building because you have wheels and all kinds of components of the aeroplanes surviving even those crashes with those tremendous explosions there were parts of these aircrafts everywhere every time an aeroplane crashes there are huge pieces of fuselage and etc which remain and they sometimes can fit all these things together and that was also the case at the Twin Towers three days before those buildings came down three days before, the shares in the airlines had been sold at a turnover such as had not existed ever before. And certain banks bought these. So somebody might have been tipped off that something was going on. And then a very interesting case, there was a man in your country, in Canada, who happened to be in prison. And they had caught him in a gambling situation and they imprisoned him and he said, let me go, I am clandestinely working for the CIA, I'm an agent, I was investigating money laundering, etc, etc, etc. And they would not let him go, then he gave the names of his contacts at the CIA and the CIA was probably embarrassed because of this situation and denied knowledge of it. And he was very angry because he felt he had been stabbed in the back. And this very often, often happens in this industry. And so he wrote a letter before the September 11 attack outlining some events that were going to take place. And he mentioned that aircraft were going to fly into the Twin Towers and into the Pentagon. Now nobody made any use of these, but when it actually happened, then this came to the fore. So here was a CIA agent who said ahead of time that this was going to happen. Could be chance, could not be chance. You decide for yourself. A certain Atta, the man who is supposed to have planned this, with only in-flight training, with absolute precision, they went into those buildings, this is an amazing story. He received funds, 100,000 US dollars, from Pakistan's secret, society, uh, uh, secret service into his bank accounts. And they worked very closely with the United States. So here had been a transfer of money. But the plot doesn't end there. The Spurs is it's the Pentagon facts. The evil sits in the Pentagon. Now who is this man that wrote this? This is uh, the political scientist Thierry Maison from France and uh, he has some very interesting to say. Who was it? What happened over here? How come they had all the names of all these people and yet there is no real evidence that these people were actually on board? Uh, here's the story. I'm just giving it to you with the passengers, the, uh, machines that flew into uh, these twin towers. And then there's this fascinating case of the other aeroplane 
that went into the Pentagon. And here are the pictures that were published. The dates were strangely wrong. They were September 12, but apparently they said it's because they released them the next day. And what you see is smoke over there. There are no debris parts, nothing. Here is a piece missing, no picture. There you have an impact of uh, a flame and you have this fireball over here. That's it. If you look then on the lawn, this is all that was found, but no part of a United Na uh, Airlines aircraft. No parts, nothing. Nothing whatsoever. This is the hole that was seen after the event, and most of this hole happened well after the event. So the question is, why are there no aircraft parts? Again, all the black boxes disappeared. There were no black boxes that survived. And the hole is way too small for something like that to actually have happened. Because nowhere in the world, even in the Lockerbie disaster, there was a case where there were no aircraft parts. Nothing. There was just nothing. What is even more interested, interesting in this situation is when you look at this, when the United States rules the world, the Catholic Church will rule the world. Archbishop Quigley, 1903. Let me go back to the September 11. To rule the world, you have to be able to have access to the entire world whenever you want to, however you want to. Now this airplane that struck the Pentagon, and the other one that fell by chance. Did you know about that? The other one that fell. And apparently there were terrorists on board that were overcome by loyal citizens. The interesting part is that that airplane struck the ground and never struck any building. It came down. And as it came down, there was a hole in the ground. And the mayor and the first people of that area ran to the place, and here was a hole in the ground, but no aircraft debris. None. None whatsoever. Not the slightest piece. Nothing. So the whole aircraft disappeared into a hole, which was not very large, and there was no debris, and no black boxes, and nothing. Something like this has never, ever happened, ever before. But what is even more sinister is the following. Because the people that had died on the aeroplane, their descendants or their inheritors cannot claim if there is no body. But in the investigation, they identified every single human body with their blood group and body parts that were given to all the family. There were no aircraft parts, there was nothing of that nature found, no aeroplane whatsoever. And yet, they could identify everybody. Does that make any sense? It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And there were apparently phone calls between the aircraft and the Pentagon. Such was the information that was released. And the information was that there was a terrorist group, Arab terrorists, that were attacking this place, and the phone call was made with a handy, with a cell phone. But then, of course, they found out that if you make a phone call with a cell phone, then you get an account for that phone call. And there was no record of such a phone call. So the Pentagon backtracked one and said, yes, excuse me, we didn't actually uh, make, get the phone call from a cell phone. We got it from the onboard telephone. That's how it happened. And again, they did an investigation. If you make a telephone call on an onboard phone, then you swipe your credit card through it, and there must be a record of a credit card transaction from that phone but there was no record. So the Pentagon backtracked again and said, yes, that is true, but it was done as a collect call. 
That's why there was no credit card because the individual had forgotten the credit card. But you cannot make a collect call from an onboard telephone. And there the story died. So here are four aircraft, no parts except the ones at the Twin Towers. There are holes in the ground and no aircraft whatsoever, but all the pieces of the bodies with the DNA analyses. These are interesting, very interesting facts. They had planned previously in the Bay of Pigs one such operation, apparently, this is history, where they were going to dupe the world by having one aircraft take off, land, the people get out, and then another one radio control take off and create the situation that they wanted without any people on board. This had been done before in the United States. So ask yourself the following questions. How is it possible that all this circumstantial evidence points to nobody out there? Nobody out there. Then came anthrax scares. And when eventually someone high up in politics suggested that uh, it seems to come from a laboratory within, suddenly there was absolute silence. So let us not continue with the September 11 and ask and say it was this or that party. The fact of the matter is this is a very strange situation. And if you look at the high role players in the United States, whether it's Marilyn Albright or any one of them, they use brooches which depict the Luciferian connections like goats and all of these. President Clinton here is receiving the host publicly and he claims not to be a Roman Catholic. That is impossible. Hillary Clinton is wearing the Phoenix Rising, which is a Masonic symbol. Uh, Sherry Blair uses Masonic signals. The presidents, the prime ministers of the world, whether the Thatchers or the Carters or the whoever they are, all of them seem to belong to insider organizations. Whether they are religious leaders or political leaders or whether they are Europeans or Americans or Eastern, all of them seem to be involved. So before we continue, uh, let us first contemplate what happens in the Africa situation. But we'll do that in another session. If we look at Africa and Rome, this will give us an idea of what the New World Order is going to be all about. Africa and what they have done to Africa serves as a model for what will happen in the entire world. The great African leaders and the, the tyrants of the past, like the Idi Amins, these people have all received exile and were probably high Masonics. When we look at the Southern Africa, South Africa situation, where you had the black-white issue, the apartheid issue, the role players, again, were all Masons. This is Foster, the president, and he gives a Masonic signal, and he was a Freemason. If we look at Nelson Mandela, he is a Prince Hall Freemason. So again, both sides are on the same side of a secret society. If we look at um, de Klerk and Nelson Mandela, we have the same situation there. Mandela is compared to Jesus Christ. They lift him up. They have a synthesis and an antithesis. And he receives the host publicly, although he declines to say that he is Roman Catholic. He says he's not Roman Catholic. Now, Roman Catholic canon law states that you cannot receive the host if you are not a Roman Catholic. So these people are really something else. Here he has a Hindu uh, marriage with the widow of Samora Marshall. Now, Samora Marshall is another story, and uh, his anti-Christian statements are historic. He also had a, 
a Jewish wedding at the same ceremony and a Muslim showing that all religions are one with him. The new political face is totally Masonic and in 1992 already it was known that Mugabe of Zimbabwe was going to take the farms away from the people that lived there. This is before he started doing this. They had already said it. Mugabe is going to take white farms very soon. It was in 1992. Today, this is a fact. Der Spiegel published, Die Deutschen müssen raus, the Germans must get out, all whites must get out. Here's a cartoon of Kissinger pointing to the fact that the whites must get out of Africa. Here is the current president of South Africa, Mbeki and uh, Mugabe. They are hand in hand on this issue. He refuses to rebuke Mugabe for taking the farms by force. In South Africa itself, 4,000 farmers at least have died and have been killed as they have been driven off their land. Nobody hears about these things in the world. Zimbabwe lies in ruins. But what do we find here? A tremendous building going up. And what is it called? The Jesuit province of Zimbabwe. So the Jesuits are totally in control in that country. Jesuit school of philosophy and the humanities, brand new buildings while a country lies in ruins. They're preparing for a final order. And all the black leaders are in the same level as all the European and American leaders. They all belong to the same club. Now, what is this new world order? Here is the new South African coat of arms where you can see the phoenix rising out of the ashes, the crown of Mitra with the, with the seven rays. All the symbolism points to the same thing. I'm going to run you through the new economic order of the New World Order. And these are now quotes from Roman Catholic sources themselves. And I would like to tell you that you haven't experienced anything yet. Waiting to come to you. And I can tell you what it feels like because I have experienced it. If you ever want to read an interesting book, read Ecclesiastical Megalomania, but I'll be quoting from encyclicals and all these things. According to canon law, the control of all property of the Roman church state belongs to the Pope, its supreme emperor. Everything I say will have a quote now. Everything is substantiated by either a papal encyclical or any one of these. Now, communism took all property away and made it the state's property. Capitalism says the property belongs to the individual and nobody has the right to take it away. Now, if that is thesis and antithesis, then something in between is what we will want. So the Pope condemned communism, but he also condemns capitalism. The new world order will be something in between in the name of fairness. So let us have a look at these issues. The economic thought of the Roman Catholic Church, private property. Thomas Aquinas wrote no treatise on economics, but he's thinking based on that of the of Aristotle is foundational for understanding the economic thought of the Roman Catholic Church. Every time there is a quote. Now what did Thomas Aquinas say? Roman Catholic economic thought is developed as developed by the popes in their encyclicals and by the Roman Church State Councils has been a contributor to one, feudalism, guild socialism in Europe during the Middle Ages, fascism in Italy, Spain, Portugal, Nazism in Germany in the 20th century, interventionism and redistributive state in the West, including the United States in the 20th century, and liberation theology in Latin America and Africa in the 20th century. What does this mean? Thomas Aquinas said, the possession of all things in common is natural law. Thomas wrote, the possession of all things in common and use of universal freedom are said to be of the natural law because to wit the distinction of positions and slavery were not brought in by nature but devised by human reason for the benefit of human life. Now what does all that mean? It simply means property is for common good. You may own it but it is for common good. The community of goods, wrote Thomas, is ascribed to natural law 
not that the natural law dictates that all things should be possessed in common and that nothing should be possessed as one own, as one's own. So you may possess things, yes. But because the division of possessions is not according to natural law, but rather arose from human agreement, which belongs to positive law, they talk such drivel, it's interesting, never mind. Hence the ownership of possessions is not contrary to natural law, but an addition thereto devised by human reason. Let's continue. Thomas wrote, hence... Whatever certain people have in superabundance is due by natural law to the purpose of succoring the poor. Okay, now we're getting there. You may possess things, whatever you possess, but whatever you possess more than you need is there for the common good of those that don't have. Does that make sense? Now what if you create two classes of individuals, the rich and the poor? Or what if there is a situation where you have two classes, the rich and the poor. You can go across the world and you can look at the rich nations and the poor nations and you will find that the rich nations are all the Protestant nations. Have you noticed that? All the Protestant nations are the rich. Now what if you had a plan to disinherit them all? So that you would again be ruler and they would have to come and beg at your feet for anything like that. Now let's have a look at this, how this uh, unfolds. For the purpose of succoring the poor. Because the goods of some are due to others by natural law, there is no sin if the poor take the goods of their neighbors. Thomas wrote, in cases of need, all things are common property so that there would seem to be no sin in taking another's properties, for the need has made it common. Okay. Now, there's the aspect of sharing. If I see my neighbor in trouble, as a good Christian, I will help him out, right? Yes. But now we're looking at law. So if my neighbor has need, and who determines the need? He. He determines the need. I have need. I have a need. I have a need of a television and I don't have one, and you have one, and you have money, and you can go and buy yourself another one, I have need of your television. Can he then take it without being a sinner, yes or no? According to this, yes. What if you have a car and he doesn't have one? He can take it without sin, according to Thomas Aquinas. Now, this was a long time ago. Surely this doesn't apply today. Well, we'll see. Not only is such taking of another's property not a sin, it is not even a crime, according to Thomas. It is lawful for a man to succor his own need by means of another's property by taking it either openly or secretly, nor is this, properly speaking, theft and robbery. It is not theft, properly speaking, to take secretly and use another's property in a case of extreme need, because that which he takes for the support of his life becomes his own property by reason of that need. In a case of a like need, a man may also take secretly another's property in order to succor his neighbor in need. Oh, this gets very interesting. Now, did you know that if I leave my property unattended in South Africa and somebody moves in, I cannot throw him out. He's in because he has need. That's the law. And you think that is a South African law? No, that is a British law as well. That is a law virtually all over the country now, but it's not being implemented because... The situation is not such yet that it has to be implemented everywhere. Once you start opening the borders and millions of poor people start coming in, well then there will be great need. What did they do with need overseas? So, in South Africa, people go on holiday, they come back, their house is occupied. And they can't throw the people out. Because their property is in their name, they have to pay the bills, they have to pay the rates, they have to pay all those things, but need made it common, therefore that man can move in. Is that the situation? Yes it is, it gets worse. The Roman Catholic doctrine of private property is echoed in the 19th century communist slogan, from each according to his ability to each according to his need. Can you see the Roman Catholic doctrine there? Human rights are more important than property rights. It was the creed of Lyndon Johnson's great society. We shall take from the haves and give to the have-nots who need it so much. Lyndon Johnson said that. What continent is that? It appears in the literature of fascism, Nazism, liberation theology, interventionism, and socialism. 
the universal destination of goods. This is John Paul II's expression of it in 1987 in an encyclical called On Social Concern. It is necessary to state once more the characteristic principle of Christian social doctrine. The goods of this world are originally meant for all. The right of private property is valid and necessary, but it does not nullify the value of this principle. Private property, in fact, is under a social mortgage, which means that it has an intrinsically social function based upon the justified precisely by the principle of universal destination of goods. Oops! What did John Paul II just say? He said that what Thomas said is what I say. You may have private property. The Roman Catholic Church is for private property. That sounds very nice. But it's never qualified that that property is only yours for common good. So one day you wake up and in your garden you have squatters. And you call the police and you say, hey. Or you go out and you say, get off my property. And they say, let me alone or I'll blow your head off. Hey, you go to the cops, you say, cops, come help here, there are people squatting on my land. Sorry, they have need. You have too much land anyway, live with it. Okay. Pope Paul VI made the point quite clear in 1967, encyclical on the progress of people. Each man has therefore the right to find in the world what is necessary for himself. This gets interesting. The recent council, Vatican II, reminded us of this. God intended the earth and all that it contains for the use of every human being and people. Thus, as all men follow justice and unite in charity, created goods, created goods, should abound for them on a reasonable basis. All other rights whatsoever, including those of property and of free commerce, are to be subordinate to this principle. That means if I have need of a manufactured good, can I take it? So now I'm driving my car and we have a hijacking just about every 12 minutes. And a gun comes in and says, get out of the car. And I relinquish my car. And if I don't, what happens to me? I get shot. The man has need of my car. It's gone. Finished. In my own church at home, we've had hijackings after hijackings. Even the pastor they beat him up and tried to put him into the trunk of the car. They would have killed him. He managed to fight himself free and off he went without his car. Do you think there's any big action to find these things? No, occasionally here and occasionally there. Do you think there's any big action when the farmers are killed and they move onto the lands? No, a little bit here and a little bit there just to keep people happy. But basically nothing is done and the police hands are cut off. The law says that. There's nothing you can do. The other day, for, uh, two cyclists were traveling along when they were hijacked by five gunmen demanding their bikes. So they took out, they were armed, because they expect this is becoming like the Wild West, and they defended themselves, injured one, and got away. And guess what? The two cyclists are in jail. Yes, serving a sentence for injuring someone without need. They could have given them the bicycles. That would have solved the problem. You see how the law has turned upside down. Gandium et spes, the Vatican II Constitution, Pope Paul quoted, explains at greater length. If one is in extreme necessity, he has the right to procure for himself what he needs out of the riches of others. Now, who defines necessity? Since there are so many people prostrate with hunger in the world, the Sacred Council urges all, both individuals and governments, to remember the aphorism of the fathers. Feed the man dying of hunger, because if you have not fed him, you have killed him. Therefore, because private property is immoral, all men, individuals and governments, have the moral obligation to redistribute goods held unjustly by property owners. Have you heard of redistribution of goods lately? Have you heard of it many times lately? Yes, there is going to be a redistribution. All goods includes not just goods found in nature, but manufactures goods as well. John Paul II declared that all men must have access to those goods, quote, which are intended for common use, both the goods of nature and manufactured goods. 
I own nothing. Only on paper do I own every, anything. The state rules supreme. My life soon could be a misery. So if you are attached to your homes here in Canada, and this is the basis for the New World Order, if you are attached to your cars and your televisions and all these things, loosen yourself. Because soon they will be redistributed and there will be nothing that the white or black or pink Protestant can do about it. And if some other suffers in the way, that is fair enough, the ends justifies the means, the redistribution will go as it should be. Rerum Novarum. Who's heard of Rerum Novarum? This is the papal encyclical that was issued that is being quoted to this day, Pope John's. And uh, to this day, all of them make reference to this, including Pope John Paul II, says this is the encyclical that forms the basis of the New World Order. Well, I thought it's important to study it. One of the Roman Church, Church State's most influential statements on economic matters is the encyclical Rerum Novarum on the condition of the working classes. The Roman Church State allied herself with the proletariat, which in Marxism is the great and final enemy of the capitalist order. Pious writing declared that rerum novarum, however, stood out in this, that it laid down for all mankind unerring rules for the right solution of difficult problems of human solidarity called the social question. Now, let's see. By far the most notable evidence of the social teaching and action which the Church has set forth through the centuries, undoubtedly, is the encyclical Rerum Novarum, issued 70 years ago. The norms and recommendations contained therein were so momentous that their memory will never fall into oblivion. John, Mater e Magistra, the papacy speaking. Pope Pius told us that the encyclical Rerum Novarum was instrumental in ending Leosphere capitalism in the 20th century by ushering in an era of effective interference by the government. Have you got this? Let's see how it ends up. Rerum Novarum was the voice of moral authority needed to ensure the development of effective interference by all governments in the 20th century. How many governments? All. Pius wrote, It is not surprising, therefore, that under the teaching and guidance of the Church, Many learned priests and laymen earnestly devoted themselves to problems of elaborating social and economic science in according with the condition of our age. Under the guidance and light of Leo's encyclical, Rerum Novarum was thus involved a truly Christian social science, which continues to be fostered and enriched daily. Tireless labors, all these people. Labors, now note carefully, of those picked men whom we have named the auxiliaries of the church. So everybody working in the secret societies, the Opus Dei, the this, the Mites of Malta, the Knights of Columbus, all of these people working, those picked men, to bring this about. Nor were there the only blessings which followed from the encyclical. The doctrine of Nerum Ruvarum began little by little to penetrate amongst those who, being outside Catholic unity, do not recognize the authority of the church. And these Catholic principles of sociology, sociology gradually became the part of the intellectual heritage of the whole human race. Where are we going? I'd like to know. Thus too we rejoice that the Catholic truths proclaimed so vigorously by our illustrious predecessor are advanced and advocated not merely in non-Catholic books and journals, but frequently in legislative assemblies and in courts of justice. Those picked men whom we have named the auxiliaries of the church who have been instrumental. This is John Robbins writing. Who are they? Under fascism, property owners may keep their property titles and deeds, but the use of their property is, as Leo wrote, common. Fascism is a form of socialism that retains the forms and trappings of capitalism, but not its substance. This is basically what it boils down to. When we speak of reform of institutions, the state becomes chiefly to mind. Not as if universal well-being were to be expected from its activities. And what is the state going to do in all of this? The experiment with economic freedom, Pius wrote, must end. 
and economic life must again be subjected to planning and government. Who wants to control your economic life? Government. John Paul II wrote in his Solicitudo Re Socialis on Social Concern, it is necessary to state once more the characteristic principle of Christian social doctrine. The goods of this world are meant for all. Private property is under social mortgage. These are the things which will be controlled. He wrote, A faithful echo of the centuries-old tradition of the Church regarding the universal purpose of good. In today's world, wrote the Pope, we are faced with a serious problem of unequal distribution of the means of subsistence originally meant for everybody. Then came liberation theology, and Pius wrote an encyclical on atheistic communism, an age like ours where unusual misery has resulted. Who created the misery? They created it so that they can create the solution which they want. So, in Africa, they elevate a few and suppress the masses. Then they turn it around and they create the situation that they want. They create communism, they create the chaos. Out of the chaos, they create the social order which they want. So the second reign of terror was supported by the papacy. Father Camilo Terras, who was shot in 1966, declared, the Catholic who is not a revolutionary is living in mortal sin. Pope John Paul II wrote in 1968, the church does not hesitate to defend fearlessly the just and noble cause of human rights and to support courageous reforms leading to a better distribution of goods, including earthly goods such as education, health service, housing, and so forth. Now we come to human rights. What did we read about in the French Revolution? What's going to be the standard of the world? Human rights. You have a right to property, you have a right to anything that you have need of. We are convinced that the theology of liberation is not only timely, but useful and necessary. That's what the Pope says, not me. This is his words directly. John Paul II, letter to Brazilian bishops. It should constitute a new stage of the theological reflection initiated within the apostolic uh, tradition. And then he refers to rerum novarum. Franklin Roosevelt, when he was elected, he made... Professor Ryan, part of his administration. Now, who was he? Ryan wrote in 1931, The workers have a claim upon industry for all the means of living from the time they begin to work until they die. When industry does not do it directly, then it is the business of government to enforce it upon industry. See how it starts? Right. Now, let's look at some of the human rights. You have a right to freely found unions for working people. You have a right to culture, a right to emigrate, a right to immigrate, a right to food, a right to clothing, a right to rest, a right to medical care, a right to just wage, a right to life, a right to safe environment, a right to personal security of workers, a right to family life, a right to private property, highly qualified of course, a right to common use of all goods is just thereafter, so that means nothing. A right to work, a right to pension, a right to old age, insurance, a right to association, a right to security, a right to integrity, a right to social services, a right to strike, a, a right to choose a state of life freely, a right to found a family, a right to education, employment, good reputation, respect, appropriate information, a right to the upright, blah, 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 protection of privacy, right to rightful freedom, uh, professional training, quality, right to adequate health care. Oh, it's laborious. How do you control that? How do you control it? If you're going to control every aspect of that, then you must control every aspect of a person's life. You will not be able to go to the toilet in future without making a triple application to the Vatican. <laughs> they're going to control every single aspect of your lives. That's what they're going to control. And government is going to become super huge. Now where's the money going to come from? From you. Now when the money comes from you, what then happens to your wealth? 
it gets less and less and less and less. That means the middle class will disappear. How many classes under Catholicism in the Middle Ages? Two. There was a feudal class, the Goyim, and there was the upper class who controlled everything. Now, if we take employment, in my country employment was running at almost 50%. In Germany, it was running at point something percent. And then it went up to 2, 3, 5, 10, 20 percent. Now unemployment is rife in Europe. Why? Because all the East Bloc countries are now being incorporated into Europe and there must be redistribution of wealth. And so it's coming down, 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 down. The recent surveys don't ask where you live, they say how many rooms have you got, how many people live there, how many this, how many that. When did they do that and in what country? In communism. And what happened if your house was bigger than your need? The one who had the need got it. But who has to pay for it? You, because you own it. It's even worse now than in communism, right? So they came to our country, now you have to register in each individual location. And you may not vote outside your location so that they have your location attached to your name. And then they came to my house and they said they want to know what is my religion. I said, I'm a Christian. They said, which denomination are you? I said, it's none of your business. They said, it is my business. Which denomination are you? I said, it's none of your business. How many rooms have you got? I said, enough. We want to know exactly how many rooms you have. I said, I have enough. But we want to know exactly. It's got nothing to do with you. Why do you want to know exactly? I could have another one next week or I could put a wall in and I could have two, right? So none of your business. You get into big trouble if you answer questions like that. You're not supposed to do that. Therefore, they must be made available to all men everything necessary for leading a life truly human. Did you know that living a life truly human is the Catholic acronym for salvation. And I will prove this to you in a future lecture, where they say, to be saved means to live a life truly human. That means the kingdom of God for Catholicism is the kingdom of Catholicism ruling the world on this earth, and giving everyone the capacity to live a life truly human. That means enough to take care of your basic needs and nothing else. Do you like the New World Order? Do you like it? Do you know what? They, the Bible calls him the man of sin. Now, there's another word for the redistribution of wealth, and I've given it to you already. What is it? It's called theft. That's right. The Bible says, thou shalt not steal. That means, thou shalt not take from one who has and give it to someone else. That's called theft. That's breaking the commandments of God. Is that correct? Yes. We will see that this system of human rights breaks every single commandment of God as we go along. When God distributed land to Israel, how was it distributed? as an eternal inheritance. It was your land. Ahab wanted Naboth's vineyard. And Naboth said to him, I will not sin against the Lord my God because this land has been given to me as an eternal inheritance and to my children. God gives each one a piece that is his. They take it and distribute it according to need, but you pay the bill. Fascinating. The complex circumstance of our day makes it necessary for public authority to intervene more often in social, economic, and cultural matters. The Second Vatican Council, that's what it said. So they're going to intervene at every level of your life. Lob von Gorbachev für den Papst. Gorbachev praises the Pope, and he says the Pope is right in his demand for a new world order. In 1991, the San Francisco Chronicle already said, Pope calls for a new world order. Albert Einstein says, 
Mankind's desire for peace can be realized only by the creation of a world government. With all my heart, I believe that the world's present system of sovereign nations can only lead to barbarism, war, and inhumanity, and that only law can assure progress towards a civilized, peaceful humanity. Interesting statement, Albert Einstein. What it, uh, oh, he also states, he says, there is no salvation for civilization or even the human race other than to creation of a world government. That was Albert Einstein. What did Utant, former Secretary General of the United Nations, say? He said, World Federalists hold before us the vision of a unified mankind, living in peace under a just world order. The heart of their program, a world under law, is realistic and attainable. What did Nortema Elder say? World peace is impossible without world government. Winston Churchill. These are big names. I'm not talking about small fry. The creation of an authoritative world order is the ultimate aim towards which we must strive. Charles de Gaulle, nations must unite in a world government or perish. How do you do that? How about creating so much conflict that everybody will be willing to give up their sovereignty? Do you know what? In South Africa, I give these lectures to the public. The people are in despair. They are being robbed, driven off their land, they are being murdered. Our houses look like prisons. We cannot go to sleep without locking everything. In my very own little block, We've had murder after murder after murder and robberies, aggravating robberies, and nothing seems to happen. Police don't even care. They don't even come out because there is so much turmoil all over the place that it cannot, they cannot even cope with it. So who cares about your little problem that you've just lost everything? Take it to the insurance and see if you can get it back. Irrespective of the pain, they come in, they move in, they take all your private papers, they burn them. You have no record of your life, everything's gone. They sell the furniture they don't want and the rest they keep for your, themselves and say, get lost. It's now time for redistribution. You had land before, now it's my land. That's how it goes. This is the New World Order. Welcome to the New World Order. Bertrand Russell, the only possibilities are now world government or death. The Humanist Manifesto, too, urges us to move towards the building of a world community. Robert Miller, former Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations, said, we must move as quickly as possible to a one world government, a one world religion, under a one world leader. I wonder who that is going to be. These are big Big names that I'm putting on the screen. These aren't speculators here and there. I'm often accused for speculating. Well, the biggest speculators are these people themselves. And what about this man? We saw how peace and unity was to come about. It was great. A great feeling of it was a great excitement great peace. of peace. Unity. Of love. Peace, love, and unity. Unity. Yes. Unity? Yes.
calls for a new world order. CNN, Thursday, January 1, 2004. He made his whole New Year's speech revolve around the new world order. I want to tell you today that the new world order is intended not just to unite the nations which God had separated, that's one aspect, but to eradicate Protestantism of the face of the earth. And particularly that form of Protestantism which refuses to bow to the papal Caesar. That form of Protestantism will have to go. And we will see that under the circumstances that will be created, these conditions are all in place right now. It is all there. And I will put it on the screen for you, so don't miss the next lectures. Now we're getting into hot territory. I'll put the quotes on the screen where they will tell you who the problem children are going to be. And don't think it's Islam. It's someone else. Don't miss the next exciting episodes. But before I go, I would like to remind you that Jesus said that this was going to happen. And if I know, and if I understand with my whole mind and with my whole heart, that Satan, because the dragon gave him his power and great authority, is setting up his kingdom here upon this earth, then instead of becoming disillusioned, frightened, hysterical, I know that the time must be very short, isn't that right? And I know that the Lord must be coming very soon. So, as far as I'm concerned, I have distanced myself from my property. If I literally had to come home next week and find my wife somewhere in another little room and my house occupied by whomever, then I will say, tough cheese, it's going to blow up anyway, who cares? It's going to be destroyed when the Lord comes by the brightness of his coming. Why not take it now? Have fun while you can, and I'll move on somewhere else. I don't mind building a tree house for a little while. That should be okay. If they take my cars, well, that's okay too. We'll get another one, and if we can't afford another one, we'll, we'll walk. Who cares? I really don't care anymore. But people who are losing things become desperate, and what do they do? They commit suicide. By the thousands, people are committing suicide. If they understand this message, and they understand where we are going, would they then commit suicide? No. They gather hope. They say, wow, so we're part of a big excitement, exciting end game. And this is exactly what is happening. People are getting hope, and they're giving their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ, and they are saying, Lord, save me, not only from my sin, but save me from this world. I am longing for your kingdom. Do you know what the government policy is in the kingdom of God? I've already told you. Everyone in the kingdom of God gets a dwelling place in the city built by whom? By God. And it has your name on it. Did you know that? You have a city dwelling. In the new world, what happens? God says, no longer will they build houses and others live in them. So what are you going to do? They will build houses, says the Bible, and they will plant vineyards. And no longer will you plant vine vineyards and others eat of them. What does that mean? That means you will have a country dwelling where you will have a farm which God will bless. And who does it belong to? To you. For how long? Forever. Forever and ever and ever and ever. That's God's policy. So who cares about what they're going to do? Who cares? And I has not seen nor ear has heard the wonders that God has prepared for them that love him. That does not just include the glory of seeing our king in heaven. It includes everything that goes into making life pleasant. And the new kingdom is worthy of waiting for. Really, 
I look forward to the new kingdom of God. It'll be a great place. And we will unfortunately see this world go from bad to worse. And I don't want to lie to you and say, it's going to get better. I'm going to tell you, it's going to get worse. Very much worse. What happened in the French Revolution is the forerunner of what will happen in the entire world. There will be anarchy like you cannot believe. But if you are under the protection of the Most High, nothing will happen to you. So why not accept Him? Why not say, Lord Jesus, I want you to be my personal Savior. Why not say, Lord, clean up my life. Let's walk together because your government is the only one worth having. And imagine looking in his face and saying, wow, this is my God. I've waited for him. He will save me. Heroes of Flight 93, the official version, is that this plane was heading, let's say, for example, for the White House or for the Capitol building, but that uh, some heroes on board overpowered uh, the pilot, and then the plane crashed onto the ground, killing all the occupants. Very fascinating stuff. By the way, of all the four airplanes involved, no black box has been found no black box. They are designed to withstand such crashes. There is not one that has, has remained. Now at Shanksville, what happened here? Now this we don't have in English, it's in German, so subtitles have been put underneath and you can read it in English as you go along and we can see what happened. Here the people come and they now interview the mayor of Shanksville who was one of the first at the scene as to what actually was present when they arrived. And you will find something very interesting. Ernie Stahl, der Bürgermeister der nahegelegenen Gemeinde Shanksville, erinnert sich. Well, yeah. Uh ja, mein Schwager und ein guter Freund von mir waren die Ersten hier. Sie haben in Shanksville an einer Straßenecke gestanden und sich unterhalten. Ihr Wagen stand gleich in der Nähe und so waren sie die Ersten hier. Dann kam erst die Feuerwehr. Alle waren wie vor den Kopf gestoßen, weil sie zu einem Flugzeugabsturz gerufen wurden. Aber da war kein Flugzeug. Kein Flugzeug. Sie wurden hier zu der Unfallstelle geschickt und da war kein Flugzeug? Nein, da war nichts. Nur dieses Loch. Das ist es. Das ist es, was sie sah. Ich dachte immer, das sei die Absturzstelle. Das ist sie, aber da ist nichts zu sehen. Das Flugzeug hat sich total zerlegt. Puff! Es krachte auf den Boden und löste sich auf. Vollkommen. Sage. Flugzeugtrümmer? Nicht. Stolz präsentiert die Fotografin ihr Werk genau an der Stelle, von der aus sie das Bild geknipst hat. Eine pilzförmige Rauchsäule, wie sie auch von anderen Augenzeugen beobachtet wurde. Das ist das, was wir gesehen haben. Sieht fast aus wie ein Pilz. Afghanistan. Nach einem Bombeneinschlag bildet sich genau die gleiche pilzförmige Rauchsäule wie in Shanksville. War 
es doch eine Bombe oder eine Rakete? That's an interesting story. So here you have an interview with the eyewitnesses that come to the crash site and there's no airplane. But there's a hole in the ground. And in the hole, nothing. No airplane. No airplane debris, nothing. Just a hole in the ground. In which a whole Boeing disappeared, totally dissolving itself, with nothing to show. Interestingly, they have the bodies of every single one that was on board. But there's no airplane. Now, that is weird. You must admit, that's kind of weird. And that is the picture of the, the actual cloud that formed. This photographer just happened to be there when it happened. And that is the cloud that forms when a bomb hits, like they used in Afghanistan. And the question was asked, was it perhaps a bomb and not an airplane at all? And where is the airplane? We wouldn't know, it's gone. Now, nowhere in the history of the world has an airplane like that just disappeared. I mean, imagine when your shuttle exploded up there, what a terrible disaster that was. And that was like a nuclear explosion in mid-air. They could almost reconstruct that shuttle from all the debris that they put together. Isn't that correct? And here, nothing? Nothing? No airplane? It's gone. No airplane. Very interesting. Let's go and look at what happened at the Pentagon. Amongst reports circulating is the report that there was an explosion in the Pentagon. Now, according to this, an airplane flew into the Pentagon. Let's have a look. What was aired on national television abroad? Question. Von einer Explosion ohne jegliche Beteiligung eines Flugzeugs im Inneren des Pentagon wird berichtet. Übrigens, die Fassade knickte erst später ein. Das war keine unmittelbare Folge des Aufpralls. Direkt auf den eben renovierten Teil des Pentagon zu. Nachdem das Flugzeug auf den ersten Gebäudering aufprallte, durchschlug es noch zwei weitere Ringe, um am Ende dieses 1,80 Meter große Loch zu hinterlassen. Wie schon bei dem Absturz in Shanksville löste sich auch hier das Flugzeug in Luft auf, bzw. pulverisiert. Auch nicht im Inneren des Gebäudes. Dafür nichtssagende Details. Eine Uhr, ein verkohltes Telefon, verruste Räume. Einrichtungsgegenstände. Well, there you have it. That's the second one. Here comes an airplane, crashes into the Pentagon, goes through a hole, leaves a hole 1.8 meters wide. A whole airplane leaves a hole 1.8 meters wide. The rest of it collapsed later inside the building. No airplane debris. It's completely dissolved, gone. But there are clocks and there are Telephones and furniture, they seem to have survived. Nothing else, no engine block, no nothing survived. No airplane. Whereas, if you go to the World Trade Center, where everybody saw the airplanes fly in, what do you find there? This is the situation. Ganz anders die Situation am World Trade Center. Trotz der viel massiveren Zerstörung stolpert man hier förmlich über Flugzeugteile. There was no problem there. That was a massive explosion. If anything should have ripped those planes apart, it should have been there. But there's lots of debris of airplanes. But at the Pentagon, nothing. Not a thing. At Shanksville, nothing. No airplane. Dissolved. Completely. So no wonder this Frenchman over here, Thierry Messon, says, das Böse sitzt im Pentagon. The Evil, is it in the Pentagon? This is the man who came up with some of this theory. Who was it? What happened over here? And was it perhaps totally different to what people are saying? These are pictures that were released. Interesting that the date says September 12th. They say that it's because they released it the next day. 
Here is the site of the plane when it is about to crash and then suddenly a black picture, nothing, and then you have a flame. But there's no aeroplane, nothing. Now, when an aeroplane lands on an open field at this low and it's struck right at the bottom, then the landing gear comes down automatically once the altimeter reads that and there would be a line of destruction in the lawn like you cannot believe, but there's nothing, just that hole. And this is the cloud of flame that one sees and this tiny hole in the building which then later collapsed. Any debris that you see lying outside has nothing to do with the Boeing, has nothing to do with an aeroplane. So there's no debris from an aeroplane at all. Gone. The fact of the matter is that immediately after these events the power was granted to act internationally and you had massive legislation, homeland response, all of these things came in. Now I'm not saying who it was, I'm not saying what transpired, I'm just giving you the facts as they were and you decide whether the official version is okay with you.